Yeah, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast, where we always look at an iconic game from some time in the past, revisit it, get the sort of social context of the time, etc. The legend Dino, as always, is in a wonderful stripe. Uh, may I say it's a nice shade of uh, greenish blue pastel and orange uh, Italian shirt. That's that's exactly the vibe that I'm looking for. Kind of Riviera, late 50s, hanging around, putting my feet up, doing nothing other than shooting the breeze with the likes of yourself. How are you, mate? Oh, I'm very well. Thank you very much. I'm rocking the Donny Hathaway look today. You Just are. to let you know, you yeah, that I'm bringing a lot of soul and emotion but where into is the today's programme. Where is the love? Well, it's with Dr. Alexander Gross, who's with us now. You can see from his played Czech blue and white shirt that he's bringing love into the scene. Hey, Alexander, great to have you back, by the way. I'm thrilled to win my third cap. I'm ready to play. <laughs> is it your third already? <laughs> I, I imagine I you, you will be a, a, a busy man, mentally, if nothing else, with the, yeah. the idea that uh, England now have a, a coach from one of your two countries. Yeah, it never gets easier with this split identity. <laughs> Thomas Tuchel, though, what what do you make? Was it a surprise to you, first of all, that he got uh, the England job? And uh, will he win us the World Cup? I think uh, there's few things left in football that surprise one. Uh, but um, I couldn't foresee that when I wrote my book about England-Germany rivalry. Um, Over the line. When, yeah, thank you. Uh, when Southgate was still in post, um, I knew that his time was going to come to an end soon, but I didn't quite think a German would be taking over. Um, There's an obvious question here. We were, we're debating this in on TV over here in Brazil. Had it been Klopp, it almost wouldn't be seen as a German, would it? Klopp is like, he transcend, <laughs> he's like one of us, whereas Tuchel isn't. Is that fair? I would argue that those people who still care about those things, they would have seen him very much as a German. <laughs> um, what, what frustrates me a little bit, um, given what I wrote about, is that in the English media at the moment, there just seem to be two distinct camps. One camp thinks it's, in quote marks, a dark day for England. And the other camp uh, says it doesn't, it shouldn't matter at all which is an argument I can understand, but I prefer a sort of middle ground which acknowledges that it does matter because of the weight of history and everything that's happened, but perhaps not for the reasons that some of those uh, people are are, are reaching Can we, can we call that a, a middle grunder? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that works for me too. <laughs> Oi, none of that bad language, for goodness <laughs> sake. Um, it does matter, though. It does matter because it's a cultural thing. Exactly, the yeah. The way that we play football in that respect. Germans play... I think you can acknowledge that it matters without being xenophobic or jingoistic. Exactly. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, um, the Germans, in a way, they play a similar type of... You know, I, I think you described it once upon a time, Tim, as a Protestant work ethic kind of football. And in another way, they're just, they are the missing, or they have the missing pieces as to why, you know, England hasn't won the World Cup since 1960. I think Tim Tim likes to talk about Northern European brutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an Italian kind of perspective. Il bruto del norte. <laughs> 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 but the, 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 these these two uh, identities that you have, tell us about when you moved from one country to the other, and the importance of a certain German in helping you establish your your new identity in your new country. That's right. That's actually the exact reason why we're here today. Um, is the arrival of Jürgen Klinsmann at Spurs. And um, I also, in thinking about this chat today, Tim, I realised that it was also an important move for you that year, wasn't it? Because I think you moved to Brazil in the same year. I moved. and The game that we're talking about, it's the first game of the 1994-95 Premier League season. So it's the season just Correct. after the World Cup and, and Tottenham have signed Klinsmann. And Dumitrescu yeah. from the, the Romania side. So this is the 20th of August. 
And I left your shores, left the English shores on the 11th of August. I arrived in the morning of the 12th of August. So this is the world that I left behind. Uh, and it, That's right. It, I, I arrived from Germany as a nine-year-old boy in May that right. year. And uh, Dot, and I'm sure you know what was a 50th anniversary in June 1994. <laughs> 50th anniversary, 1994. Ooh, it has June the to 6th. Be, June the 6th, 1994. So you, it was busy. <laughs> it was busy burning down the science lab I, instead of no, learning about D Day. Live, try, no, well, D Day. There you go. Thank you very <laughs> much. Appreciate. I, I knew it was the war. At least I got the right. You know. Uh, you know, no, I'd, I'd, I'd been at my I'd been at my new school in uh, in England for about two weeks uh, when that anniversary came round, and the, the the halls and the walls were bedecked with wow. D Day posters and images and slogans, and it was. Uh, I, I think I was young enough. I was nine years old, so I was young enough to be able to call that an interesting start to <laughs> school, rather than something worse. <laughs> I feel a bit for my older sister, who was fourteen. She probably had worse, but um, so yeah, I was dropped into that. So sorry, Alexander. How, how did it? How did it make you feel? No, I think I was young enough just to see that as quite an interesting experience. I don't see it as having suffered any sort of uh, bullying or anything like that, but it was quite bewildering. And um, one of my favourite things that Tim always talks about is how football allows people to feel represented. And um, I think in a small way, when I found out later that summer that uh, an English team that I had never heard of <laughs> had signed uh, Jürgen Klinsmann, then it made me feel a bit of that. It, it gave me an opportunity to choose an English team to say I support in the playground and to collect the football stickers and all that. And um, and the, the, the rest is history. It's now I'm I'm one of those people who's really obsessive and who's a, a statistician when it comes to football as well. I know that my last game uh, this past weekend was game number one thousand five hundred twenty-seven that I've supported this club, <laughs> and I know I know that game number <laughs> one in that sequence is the game we're discussing wow. today. Wow. That... And it's the important game. It's the important game in terms of your support, isn't it? That's um, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Um, I A little bit of what you say I share. Obviously. Because, yeah. well, no, just in terms of it's difficult not to support the team where the first player from your country is yeah. playing. You know, it's difficult not, even if you support another team already, like... West Ham, for me, was the obvious choice of uh, team because they had Adi Koka there. I'd never heard of a Nigerian playing football. And it, even yeah. though, you know, he wasn't on my landscape so much, I always had a, a love for West Ham. And I, I don't mean that in any sort of xenophobic way other than just to say that you enter football in a way, bringing some of your culture with you. And when you don't see it, the first place that shows it mm. pulls you in, you know, or the mm. first player that shows it. Uh, there was an Italian player, and I can't remember his name, um, but he was in the World Cup. He was a forward and a winger, and um, he there was they played an African team. I can't remember which. It's almost insignificant because there was a point where he went across to all the African players, you know, to hug them and to praise them and was very gentlemanly. Whereas a lot of the Italians, they were just like celebrating the victory that they had had. And it always, it always stuck with me. And since then, I've had a love for the Italian national team just through that one person, you know? Yeah. I think um, I can honestly say when I moved over, uh, that summer, 94, I was aware of more Nigerian footballers Dutton, than English footballers wow. because of that World Cup. And J JJ Okocha had been huge in Germany. It's amazing. And um, mm. I saw Amakachi at the World Cup and Nigeria mm. doing well. I honestly went when that was my first couple of months in England and I wasn't even aware of England really as a team and that they weren't in the World Cup. I didn't miss them. I was just looking forward to watching Germany. Um, but the fact that the thing about choosing Tottenham and, and Klinsman arriving, I have a very unlikely person to thank for that, which was my English uncle who, um, 
was a Londoner and he came over to visit us uh, as we were settling in. And I think he used the words uh, something like, um, uh, there's a team in London who've just signed one of your mob. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, he was, and he was a lifelong Chelsea fan. So his <laughs> generosity to, 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 to turn me towards Spurs, I'll forever be thankful for. Do, do, do you have, is it one English parent and one German parent? And you'd lived your nine years. Yeah, it's in- the other way around from... It's the other way around from what most people expect. Most people, when they ask me, they expect that I'm a war child or a military child, I mean, um, of a, of a German, uh, sorry, of an English soldier stationed in Germany, but actually my mother's English and went over there. Uh, when I was on to talk about the um, England-Germany match in 1970, we spoke about how it was the same week that my mum moved over there, mm. uh, June 1970, and she stayed for nearly 30 years so so in, in your house ha- yeah, my, my dad's from germany in your house growing up had you grown yeah. up with much english influence or had it been a german household yeah i think there was english influence but no english language um because my parents i think they intended to bring me up uh my sister and myself bring us up bilingual but they failed <laughs> and, it's hard uh, that's hard I, 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 that. I understand it's, it's very easy. hard yeah. but, um, but they uh then as we moved over um that just came by hook or by crook I, I was put into an english school and i had to sink or swim because nobody there spoke german so so you, you didn't speak much of the language when he came over no, certainly for that 50th anniversary of D-Day, I knew nothing. <laughs> but but in the school playground, I'm presuming you knew something uh, in terms of Yeah, football. well, the, fo- the football stickers were the principal currency, weren't they? So, yes, they were. Uh, yes, they were. Once I attached myself to Tottenham, I, I, I knew what to look out for there. But oh, were you not playing football as well on the concrete playgrounds? Yes, yeah. But I, I, when I arrived, the only English player I'd really heard of was Lineker. And when I then found out that he played for Spurs, I was really made up as well. <laughs> well, this, this, this really is a story, isn't it, of mm. the immigrant, the, yeah. the integration of, of 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 an immigrant child through football. This this really is our story. Yeah. Do you yeah, know? I mean, um, go on, Dustin. No, I, I was going to say, um, I've often mentioned about going to see a Spurs play at White Hart Lane back from the earliest memory in 1968, the first time I went, I've often spoken about the apparent love that I was shown. You know, we were kids who we were like, I was eight years old. There wasn't, there was no sort of sign of racism as I recall, but you know, other people might have a different experience. But actually just when you talk about the playground there, I think the most sort of uh, multicultural harmony I've ever felt was in the school playground coming. So I I moved from, so I'd been, by the time I moved to Tottenham, I'd been in Britain for three years. I came in 65, eight years old in the school playground, new school, you know, you got, you got to find your way around. If you're a boy, you got to find your way around a new junior school because you got to know who's who, you got to know who the best fighter in the school is, who the second best fighter in the school is and all of that sort of landscape. But what I remember most vividly, as well as we used to play for those picture cards, you know, there was a game that you could sort of knock other people's picture cards uh, down. I remember this one game and there was like hundreds and hundreds. I couldn't afford the picture cards. So the only way I could have them was to nick them, you know, and this time was (laughs) to nick them off fellow pupils because there was this one game where there was like about a hundred picture cards on the ground so whoever knocked the last card down that was up against the wall would win them all and eventually this guy the skinny little guy called terry collier yes Mm -hmm. terry collier as in whatever happened to the likely lads um he he knocks it down and everybody like was celebrating but miss all this celebrating people like stuffing cards up their jumpers and everything i think i stuffed a bit too much Terry Collier was the second best fighter in the school <laughs> and he saw me and he gave me a real, and he was like three years old, he gave me a real punch in the stomach and all the cards fell mm. out. He might give me a couple mm. of slaps after that as well. So I learned my lesson, but back to the racial <laughs> harmony. When I, when I think back, imagine the whole playground, 
the boys' side, because it was Victorian school, so girls were on one side of the building, we were on the other side in terms of playgrounds. But um, imagine on the boys' side, the entire school is playing one game of football. One game. So there's like 100 kids on one side and 100 kids on the other side. The entire playground. If you'd been looking at that playground from the outside, the majority were white, but there's probably... 20% of us, yeah, I would say, that were black. And there was probably another 20% that were Asian. And all of these kids have no impression or they've got no uh, opinion about a colour of a skin. It's not about that. We were just all together. And I, I remember uh, that game very, very vividly. And uh, Tottenham was a really interesting place to be in when I was growing up, a really interesting place between the ages of, let's say, 1968 and 72. By about 73, things started getting a little bit stressful, uh, mainly because the National Front had moved into town, but um, otherwise, you know, a very, very welcoming place. I mean, I saw the interview with, uh, uh, or at least the interview with the fans that uh, um, we were watching ahead of this game that we're going to talk about, the Tottenham fans, and there is no kind of, oh, remember the war kind of thing. There, there's none of that. They're just like really excited about seeing. We've seen him in no, the World in, Cup. In fact, uh, in fact, there's quite the opposite, which was the uh, the chant referencing him being German at a Jewish club, which, uh, <laughs> which, yes. absolutely, which was that sort oh, of, right. uh, <laughs> of subversive humour that Tottenham fans Jim Chimney, Jim Chimney, yeah. Jim Chim Chiru, yes. That's right. Okay, <laughs> I don't remember that at all. But... But there's something yeah. that, that you dug up. Um, which was uh, uh, a newspaper cartoon di uh, sequence of diagrams. From, yeah, from, from earlier that summer. About yeah. you know a, a guide a, a guideline to uh, to Jurgen Klinsmann's diving. Yeah, it's in the Guardian. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I saw it, I thought, oh, this will be the Daily Mail or something. It's in the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people were having great fun with that. Yeah, it was tongue in cheek, though, wasn't it? It was tongue in cheek. Let's stress that. It's not, they're not attacking Kinsman. His reputation by the time he got to Tottenham, he had a reputation for diving. Now, we may not like it, but look at those World Cup matches that he played yes, against South Korea. And sorry, I have to, I have to disagree slightly, Dotton, when you say it was um, tongue in cheek, because there was one or two articles that summer before he signed. There's the famous one from, um, uh, what was his name? Um, Adam Anthony, I think was his name. There's the famous one who wrote in The Guardian, Why I Hate Jürgen Klinsmann. Yes. And then a couple of months later, he, he wrote Why I Love mm -hmm. Jürgen Klinsmann. But he was by no means the only one. There was also the Times uh, sports writer, Simon Barnes. He wrote mm. some critical pieces on him and then went back on it when he started playing for Spurs. But I think the criticism and dislike of him before he signed in England was quite real. I don't think it was just... Oh, no, joke. I was thinking I think... about the cartoon. The cartoon specifically yeah, yeah. was... I think that was tongue-in-cheek. Um, I don't And think... I think... Um, I don't know if Tim agrees with me, but I think it... Given that not many games were on TV at the time, um, certainly sort of... You wouldn't have seen him play in Italy or in France for Monaco. So I think the reputation came from Italia 90, didn't it? In the final... And um, in Germany, it's a bit strange that the accusation that you were a, a diver or making a meal of it, things in that game, because that game is seen as a war, an absolute battle against uh, what I can only kindly call a team that had lost its <laughs> sheen from Mexico 86. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, but I think he, he got he got a man sent off, as the English press would put it, and then also won the penalty that won the World Cup. So, um, but yeah, can you back him up there, Tim, or maybe not? Um, I remember seeing him quite a lot for Inter when he was at uh, Inter Milan yeah. because we did used to get Italian football on on Channel Four. But he be, be, um, prior to coming to Tottenham, he'd been at Monaco, hadn't he? So we hadn't we hadn't yeah. seen. Ironically, under Arsene Wenger. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one thing you instantly notice about him in this game is how he's playing with a smile on his face. He just seems. Yes. He just seems so so happy to, to to be there. Always. Yeah. Yeah. 
And he had that certain gait about him that is mentioned in one of the articles yeah. um, I was reading. No, it's, you know, he, he runs on his toes as you're supposed to, actually. He runs like an athlete. He runs yeah. with high knees, high knees, uh, back of the leg or, yeah, the heel of the leg in as yeah. high as possible. Rem to Rem bone. Reminds me of a, of a horse, knees. you know, in those equestrian things they yes. do in the Olympics. Yes. Is it yeah. dressage, yes. you know, yeah. when they make the horses dance? Dressage, yeah. Now yes. bring on the dancing but horses. It, but it's the way to run, um, as I was thought when I was going to um, a running club, the way to run to save yourself from injury, there's a sweet spot on your foot just behind the toes which is where you're supposed to look and it gives you the fastest yeah. possible it doesn't seem right but it is right and um, if you combine it with there's this, a famous but... there's a famous story in germany about him uh from the beginning of his career when he's when he's at um stuttgart kickers the um the second division side in stuttgart um and he went to uh one of the coaches there who was a well-known athletics coach in Germany at the time and he worked together with him in pre-season to work on his 100 meters time and he got it down to under 11 seconds I think and um, that he kept that secret from his club coach because his club coach would be furious if he knew that he was putting his muscles in danger like that all pre-season apparently but yeah he was um, he was so driven to do his own training like that and then there's something else I read that he he um, one thing that he was quite famous for was being good with both feet and good receiving the ball on both sides of his body. And he exhibited a kind of swaying right to left, that, like a tennis player awaiting a serve who needs to be able to act on either side. So there's all this um, evidence of be him being self-driven to coach himself, to improve himself, um, which I think is part of what I think makes up a really interesting character. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying always for the best because he's had his arguments and disagreements uh, over time, but I just think he's a very interesting person as well as player. Um, I, I think and, and I, also, I also like the fact that we're celebrating a, a player who's still alive and mm, still yeah. healthy and happy and 60, all, 60 all years of this, old this year. This, this drive, is, it kind of combines with a lightness of touch isn't it? A lot yes. I, 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 of him as a person. And I remember him yeah. giving a, a, a lecture to an audience of Brazilian coaches. Uh, it was supposed to be about 15 years ago now. And he did it in impeccable English. You know, but he he just came across like a surfer kid. You know, I remember leaning back thinking, I wish they all could be Californian Yergs. No, it, but, he drove yeah. the beetle. There's such a lightness of touch about, because quite often, the people who are who are the athletes who are that driven can be kind of the Djokovic thing, you know. The world doesn't exist apart from me and my personal yeah. best. But Klinsman doesn't seem like that. He seems a much more rounded individual. He's a fascinating uh, case study in that sense because you can imagine that rubs up the people the wrong way in some cases in Germany because it's the opposite of the German character, mm. isn't it, what you're describing? And certainly he's fallen out with people at Bayern and um, not so much the national team as far as I remember. He, he, he left after he did his job. But um, certainly he's had, in different places at different times in his career, he's had disagreements and uh, left jobs or contracts early <laughs> and um, sometimes left under a cloud. But also I think his biggest maybe his biggest um, plus point is also sometimes a failing. So he is a pioneer. Mm. He's somebody who looks outward. His career was like that. He went to Inter. Uh, then he went to England uh, when he realized that France wasn't, or Monaco, I think a special case, wasn't the right place for him as a professional. And then um, in every country he went, he, he learned the language and endeared himself to the fans. And then as a coach, he also, I mean, firstly in his, private life he moved to california and sort of adopted american methods and um college coaching and all these things that he probably talked about in that lecture mm -hmm. that you that you mentioned um and now recently he's been in south korea and all sorts so he's very open-minded but then at the same time i think maybe sometimes it's just too much for people um 
in some of the management position he's he's been in, and maybe as a player too. He certainly rubbed up uh, Alan Sugar the wrong way, didn't he? <laughs> well, we, 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 I was going to say, let's get to that if we have to. Um, <laughs> no, because I think it's just a side issue, that one, but it's the welcoming back of Klinsman to Tottenham. Yeah. After that, that is the real um, moment, I think. Uh, but well, his his last game for Spurs is as significant as his first. That's there that's you go. True. Yeah, there you go. Do you think that second to last? <laughs> I, I can sort of understand the German criticism of, of him not being, you know, you typically German hard work focused, you know, versus sprung technique, etc. But do you think that he could have? achieved more he could have been a better player if he hadn't been such a a wanderer because for me he's like a backpacker you know going from one place (laughs) have boots will travel at the moment the way that you describe him do you think if he had maybe stayed put I was uh, I was asking myself I was asking myself more uh why he's not succeeded so much as a coach Mm. Um, he was he had that what we call the summer fairy tale in Germany in the World Cup 2006 when he took over uh, a side that was uh, really at a very low point. And it, 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 it is very important, isn't it, his time with the German national team because he's the one who gets them but playing, it's just, playing a back it's four. Just that with, with, with hindsight, everybody can see that the tactics was Yogi Low. That's the thing, right? Um, but and, and delegation is of... part of it, isn't it? You know, if if you're yeah. bringing in someone who's going to do a good job under you, I think you deserve credit for that. Absolutely, still valid. Yeah, yeah. But um, no, as a player, Dotton, uh, to answer your question, I think he, what I admire about him, which is one of the things that brought him to Spurs, is this willingness to, um, to move at the right time for the right reason. So he appears to have left every club for his own personal uh, motivation, for his own personal reasons, to win certain titles or achieve certain well, he things. Won't, he life. wasn't going to win anything here, was he? Um, and it, it, no, and he, re- and he realised that, and that's why he pissed <laughs> off Alan Sugar. Right. But he'd he, he come to a madhouse. And th- th- this kind of fascinates me, because I say yeah. that this is just a moment when I check out. And at this yeah. time... In, in in Brazil, there was no almost no English football on TV, so all of this stuff I didn't see it, um, you know. Yeah. And it was even hard to get the results, you know. Uh, you used to wait for the the newspaper on on, on Monday morning to see the English results, uh, and I'd go into the yeah. British consulate over a week later and read the Sunday supplements. So I, I did I didn't see didn't see it, but it's just a madhouse. I mean, Tottenham yeah. had. The, the, the Sugar Venables fall a great out. team. Well, no. Well, they had a great team. No, we'll, we'll oh, get no, there. Okay. We'll get there. Um, the Sugar Venables fall out. And whatever you think about Venables business dealings, it was an absolute disaster. Just Well, let, let's just put it this way. The, the club I decided to support, when I started supporting them, they were on minus six points. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, there was something happening under Venables. Uh, so much youth talent was coming through. Uh, and forcing Venables out, ending that 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 project, it condemned Tottenham to to the wilderness at exactly the moment when the yeah. Premier League is is about to go whoosh. And the club spent twenty yeah. years trying to trying to make up lost ground on on that moment. So what do you do? You bring in the hero Ardiles. This was his second season in charge. The first season he'd been a bit unlucky because the side he inherited. There were three firing together. And boy, that last season of Venables, the, the last six months of it were just amazing with Sheringham, Darren Anderson and Nick Barnby firing together. It was fantastic. Yeah. And then Ardiles, his, that first season, he was unlucky in that almost the entire season, one or two or sometimes even three of them were injured at the same time. So you never had them together, the, the, the trio together at the same time. And there was a battle against relegation. They weren't far off relegation in that first season. This is the second season. He now has Anderton, Barnby and Sheringham together. But what do they do? They go out and buy strikers. There isn't a midfielder in the team. No, it's insanity no. what's happening here. It is just absolute insanity. There's not, there's, there is not a midfielder in this team. 
And I, I've never understood this from, from our dealers because he was a midfielder. You're thinking, you know, surely you're going to build your side around. You're going to have some kind of midfield. Um, but there's there's just this gaping hole in, in, in the middle of the team. And I remember during the commentary in this game, uh, on one point the commentator says, uh, is this going to be Tottenham's year for the league? And blind, you know. <laughs> Uh, it was certainly going to be a year to entertain, it was. but not to uh, amass many points. Because <laughs> they bought these players that they didn't really need. You know? and yeah. Klinsman and Dumitrescu were terrific players, all very well, but they could have done without them. And there was another another Romanian from the World Cup. Yeah, Popescu, Popescu came in well. a little bit later, who, who, was a, who, who could play midfield. At least he had that virtue. But suddenly, yeah. when you just look at the lineup, and it's just all over the place. It's so ludicrously front-loaded. Um, it's just a yeah. bizarre one. So I kind of regret missing out on it because it must have been just insane, but kind of gloriously insane. C'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la guerre, as they say in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Yoruba. Okay. Um, would you not say that the likes of Nicky Barmby and Darren Anderson were midfielders then? Not really. When Anderson was... And he, he, Anderton bombed on on the right yes, flank. Yes, and he, he became a wing-back for, for yeah. England. <clears throat> Barmby was a kind of second striker. He was a Peter Beardsley type figure. Uh, and just I think he comes from up that way as well, if I remember Yeah, right. I think he does Burley. Hull or something like that. And But they kind <laughs> yeah. of, just in order to have someone in the midfield, they kind of shoehorned him as a as a midfielder. Um, but uh, it was it was all very strange. I do regret missing it because it must have been fascinating. But obviously, on this day, you've got four different scorers from that lot. You've got Sheringham, Anderton, Barnby, Klinsman, all scoring. So it oh, you like... should have given the end away. Oh, I was going <laughs> to. Anyway, go on. Yeah, Jurgen Klinsman scores on his debut. Back to Spurs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, no, I think it, it was very exciting. It was, uh, you know, four days later at the lane on his home debut, he scores an overhead kick, a scissor kick, which he's done many, many times in Germany. Um, and I just, I, I'm now a match going fan every week, but I wasn't then. I was only nine and my parents didn't like football lamentably, but, um, I can't imagine how exciting that must've been. If you include the league cup where he scored a hat trick at Watford, he scored uh, 10 goals in his first seven. Wow. I mean, it, it must've felt if you were going to the games at that time, it must've felt like the sky was the limit, but of course, as you're saying, it was all built on tactical quicksand, really. And by, I think by the end of October, Ardiles was gone and Francis was in. So, yeah, I just think those first few weeks must have been amazing. Yeah, um, obviously, <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday do score and they could have equalised maybe even, but they do get three, which maybe explains Tim's point about the lack of a midfield. There's another Romanian in their team, Dan Petrescu. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, very good player, actually. And he's yeah. another one who, you know, is he a defender, is he a midfielder, is he a winger kind of thing? But um, the... The Sheffield Wednesday lineup, I thought, was you know quite strong as well. You know, Des yeah. Walker, you know, England's number one in that position at the time, and um, Mark Bright. I think I Des think... Walker's a bit too old by then. By then. For okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, um... his career is strange, isn't it, Des Walker? Because he was untouchable yes. for a while, and then he moved mm. to Italy, and he lost that kind of aura about him, and he was never quite. He was good. But he was—he never had the same aura of in, invincibility that, that he had at, at his height. Yeah, was never was, beat Des Walker. I was about to say, wasn't there a chant about him? That was it. Thank yeah. you for that. You see, great minds think alike in this respect. Uh, did you enjoy the match, though? Uh, revisiting it for oh. our purposes. Is that to no. me or Tim? I, 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 whoever wants to answer that, go on. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's it's. Match number one for me, um, so it means a lot to me. Um, but I, I particularly enjoy, uh, always have done, which is why I like Tim's work so much, is it looking at the context. So for me, it's like we were talking about Alan Sugar. He, he called these foreigners that were coming to the – do you remember what he called them, Dutton? Ooh. The foreigners that were coming into the league that he didn't like because they were yeah. so much money. Coming over here. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember. Do you remember the, the name he gave it them? Carlos Kickable. 
Carlos Kickerballs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I remember him saying, I remember him laugh. saying, you're not going to spunk my money all over the walls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's that element. There's the sort of there's the sort of fear or uh, suspicion of the foreigner. Uh, there's the whole thing about him diving. There's the fact that he's German, very obviously. And it's just like, he, he in his first conference, famously, he sits down and he makes a joke which can only be described as German humour. He says, can you can you tell me where the nearest diving school is in London? <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't even that funny, no, but it's like... <laughs> did you get in time? Because you're nine years old and you see Benjamin, when he scores, and he scores the winner, essentially. Um, yeah, exactly, he, yeah. He goes and dives, he does the dive, and his teammates join in doing... And it's yeah. not a bad dive, let's face it. It's not a it's bad brilliant. Dive. It's brilliant, it's brilliant. John Watson <laughs> laughed at it on Match of the Day. <laughs> we have to laugh at it. Did you get it at that time? What? What? Of course, yeah. And it was context. it was Teddy Sheringham that told him to do it, which just shows yeah. like <laughs> there was so much camaraderie straight away. Yeah, um, and it also and, showed and, uh, that it was in the zeitgeist, if it were. If I may yeah. use one German word, that I would know. It was a, a lot wrong. of things were. I mean, it's sort of around the same time you get um, Harry Enfield's Jürgen the German as well. I don't think that was an accident that he was called Jürgen. And uh, <laughs> not the most favourable oh, no, don't mind. Yeah. But like, <laughs> this this guy came from, from Germany with, and as I, as I was keen to state, he really was disliked. It wasn't just a joke. He was, he was quite universally disliked. And there's even one article, uh, sadly, I forget the journo who wrote that one, but he said... Um, when he when he arrived, I think it was the same guy who wrote "Why I Hate Klinsman." He said he was the most universally disliked man in football mm. after Maradona. He mm. said in summer '94. How long did it take and him to turn speak, that? Speaking from a British perspective, how long did it take him to turn that round? And then, yeah, exactly. And I was going to say one year later. Well, nine months later, he's Football Writers Player of the Year in England. Um, do you guys remember who the the last German was to win that one? Bert Troutman. Bert Troutman, right. 56, wow. exactly. The, oh, wow. the only other German. Um, and then two years later, uh, which I had to mention today, was he, he climbs the steps at Wembley and he picks up the European Championship trophy from the Queen at Euro 96. And Henry Winter writes, if it couldn't have been Tony Adams he was the best person to go and pick up that trophy, <laughs> Klinsman. Because by then, he'd won everybody round. The whole English press backs. How did he do backs, that? Everyone who's uh, writing about the game. Obviously, his English was excellent, as we've all pointed yep. out already. Absolutely excellent but Didn't, didn't he, he? I think, he, he, if I remember rightly, reading about this, he took a leaf out of your book, Dotton, and started quoting Shakespeare in, in, in press conferences. <laughs> I wouldn't advise that. I think it's better off trying to find the closest it, diving it, school. But it, it does show off. Well, that's why Tottenham Hotspur is the right club for him. Yeah. Full, full of tragedy. Full of Shakespearean that. tragedy. Oh, right, okay, because because okay, of Harry okay. Hotspur. Comedy. No, because yeah. of Harry oh, Hotspur. Of course, indeed. of course, of course. I like the link. Of course. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> he became Henry V, didn't he? Uh, Harry Hotspur, if my uh, chronology. He was his mate. Right. He was Henry Percy. He was his mate from Northumberland. Oh right, it was yes, of course. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I I, I did do Henry the Fourth Part One for O level. I read Henry the Fourth Part Two for my own pleasure, you know. But I just forgot about Hotspur. The, no, it wasn't just his mate. Hotspur was his rival. Hotspur was his yes, rival, wasn't it? I seem to remember. Hotspur was the antithesis because Henry the Fourth, um, sorry, Henry the Fifth, Prince Hal, as he was known then was going about right. the taverns, getting drunk with Falstaff, whereas Henry the Fourth, his father, wished, you know, he was more like Hotspur, who was ready for action at any moment. That is how Harry it Hots goes. Harry Hotspur was the uh, the volatile, bad-tempered one from up north, yeah. And that hasn't changed. <laughs> but... And, and uh, the, the, Hotspur, the Hotspur cricket ground in North London was named after him because he had a... I didn't know that. there, I believe. Oh, yeah. God, you, gosh. you, Alex, you, you have made a speciality out of English literature. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to feel that this was this was your thing? Uh, talking about the English now? Yes. Oh, um, well, that was actually, uh, I think that everything began in these weeks that we're talking about. Mm. 
in summer 1994. That's Everything amazing. really <laughs> took off. And I think uh, when I when I was first exposed to Shakespeare at school, um, I think some of the other kids were wary of it and a bit frightened of it because it was difficult and it used words that they didn't know. And for me, it was just everything was new. So I think maybe I took to it more because of that. Um, I never got on with maths. And I like to say it's because while those kids were doing maths, I was doing extra English. So I lost out a bit on things like fractions and whatnot. Also, I've just remembered you guys do an awful lot of documentary research on this show. And you look at... Um, newspaper cuttings and everything like that. I recently found something of that ilk, which was my school report from uh, July 94, so a couple of weeks in. And most of my teachers there wrote that they couldn't really assess me because of my because I didn't have the language skills yet, but they were looking forward to seeing me again in the next school year. <laughs> and then un under the sports teachers, under the subject sport, the teacher has written, cricket has confused him. <laughs> <Exclamation mark. laughs> for, for, followed by, followed by football should be a much more enjoyable experience. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, how yeah. much is Klinsman and your identification with Klinsman a part of all of this process? A, pro, you know, a part of the process that puts um, you on a path where you can become a specialist in English literature? I don't know. I, I don't see any direct link. I just think, like I said at the beginning, it's nice to have somebody um, who it's nice to feel represented. So uh, my mother always talks about Boris Becker winning Wimbledon uh, the year I was born as a as a 17 year old uh, young chap. He, he was a qualifier. He was an outsider and nobody Brilliant. saw it coming. And he he was and, so and, and she she'd made this move to Germany, and then she saw this young as, as she had a German son, she, a mm. German lad won Wimbledon, and it and it made her feel very emotional and represented, I suppose. So it's more that indirect representation. I and he moved. Uh, he moved after when he fell out with Sugar. He moved to Bayern Munich, of course, and I was born in Munich, so. Then I followed his career and I, I loved the German national team as well. So I always watched him. Um, but it's more like it was more what he achieved and the way in which he went about it rather than the mere fact that he played for the club. I think it was it was those 29 goals in the first season. And then the one we haven't mentioned yet is his second stint when he comes back for six months. Yeah, oh, tell, in I, I know nothing about that. So tell me, fill me in on uh, that. Allow me. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, firstly, um, Alan Sugar goes a bit mad and uh, gets Christian Gross from nowhere, from Grasshopper's Zurich, my namesake. So there I felt represented, having Christian Gross on the bench. Uh, he of... Um, Tube ticket fame because he yes. held up his underground card in the. In well, the he, also, he, he had but, a um, return ticket. I think he had a return ticket to <laughs> with the bit that everybody enjoyed. <laughs> you might be right. Um, anyway, he took over from um, uh, Jerry Francis at the end of ninety seven, and it was a terrible season. And um, and uh, Klinsman was drafted back in from a sort of hapless short spell at Sampdoria where again he didn't feel right so he moved on as I said before he tended to do that um and I, I remember that day as well I was 13 then or or 12 about to turn 13 and my mum said when I came home from school what's the what's the thing you'd most like to happen and I said something banal like fish and chips for my tea or something like that but she said no I mean in football what you're always going on about what's the thing you'd like the most and she broke the news to me that she'd seen on CFAX or whatever that Klinsman was back at Spurs. That was the way you got your news back then, I suppose. Yes, yes. <laughs> From your mum. <laughs> yes, yes, why not? But uh, he then he then uh, played in a team that really wasn't doing well, but he had David Ginola on the left flank. Mm. Uh, and he had Les Ferdinand knocking down balls for him. Anyway, it, it, it wasn't such a illustrious uh, four or five month spell as the first time, it was difficult to live up to that, of course, having been football of the year. But it all came to a head when uh, Spurs were 
just above the relegation zone with two games to play in real, real danger and went to Sellers Park. I just remind myself of the date of that one. That was uh, May the 2nd, 1998. And we were away at Wimbledon. Wimbledon were all but mathematically safe, but we really needed the win. And um, he scores four goals, three of them in six minutes in the second half, but he scores four goals and he makes the other two in a 6-2 win away at Wimbledon. <laughs> that amazing. is the stuff of legend That's among amazing, Spurs fans because yeah. it's when, you know, Arsenal were winning the league. We were we were in danger of going down. These are, these are the really bad times when, you know, you had to be there to really, you had to be a real fan to be there, I suppose is what I'm saying. And uh, a lot of people still talk about that 6-2 at Wimbledon. And it's been written up in the press uh, as you know, as close as you can get to a perfect performance. And that reminds me of another one, actually, in the German press, um, Tim, his performance against the Netherlands in the mm. San Siro in World Cup 90. 1990 after, is still talked yeah, about after, as, a, as a perfect 10 performance. After Voller has been sent off. Because Rudy Voller's sent off. He, yeah, to, exactly. he carries it so on he's his own. Got, he's, he's extraordinary, that game. Yeah. So to, to remind you, Dot, and that's when uh, Frank Reichard and... Um, Rudy Voller had the uh, incident of. Oh, right. Uh, I enjoyed. I enjoyed somebody calling it the incident of expectoration. <laughs> <laughs> and then how does it how does it, um, how does it end then? How did he fall out with Sugar again? Oh no, he retires at the end of the ninety eight right. season. He does. He goes to the World Cup in France uh, as Germany captain. Uh, they go out to Croatia in the court final. That was shit. Um, they, re- they really were dreadful that World Cup. Terrible. But um, that's the end of his career, and he moves to California. He, he, knew, he knew exactly what he wanted. He went straight away with his family to move to California. <laughs> yeah, no not? hanging about. Um, I did enjoy, because um, there was a certain amount of squirming Alan Sugar had to do when he brought him back, because um, as you yeah. alluded to earlier on, he had sort of said he wouldn't use Jurgen uh, Klopp's shirt to wash the, his car windows or something like that. And, Jurgen yeah, Klinsmann. Yeah. Did I say Jürgen Klinsmann? <laughs> what did You've I say? Got on the brain. Oh, Klopp. Okay, apologies. Um, yeah, Jürgen Klinsmann. Apologies. I do know which one, which Jürgen we're talking about. But um, yeah, and uh, Alan Sugar famously, you know, rolled up he, the number nine shirt for Tottenham and thrown it on the ground and said, "I wouldn't use that to wash my car with." The first time he left, yeah, he yeah, said he wouldn't wash he his car with it. So, yeah. do, do you remember how he had to squirm his way out of that when Jürgen Klinsmann returned? Did, did that ever he, reach you, Tim? No, not really. That's no, I mean, all, no, all of this is is learning for me because no, not really. Yeah. How, yeah, why did they fall out so though. badly? Um, from what I've read, it's a uh, uh, <laughs> It's essentially the same as what you witnessed between um, Sugar and Venables was a broken word. So uh, it it strikes me that Alan Sugar didn't have enough stuff in writing because he seems to have had his word broken a few times, but. He thought it was a two-year deal that uh, Klinsman came on initially, and Klinsman thought it was a one-year deal with a second-year option. And then he said, "Well, you told me this. You told me that I'm leaving now because, as you said, Tottenham are not going to win a title <laughs> with this mob. I'm off. I'm off to Bayern and to win the UEFA Cup and the title. And um, and and Sugar just thought he had he had him for two years. So." It's fascinating. Look, we've been talking about the match, but more so we've been talking about the central figure in the match because this was uh, Jurgen Klopp coming Klinsman. to English football. Oh. <laughs> I don't, why have I done that again? It's a senior moment. I apologise. This is Jurgen Klinsmann coming uh, to England and the press were out there waiting for something spectacular to happen. Well, it did happen. It's a, it's uh, a terrific Spurs goal won. that wins the game. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the use of the neck muscles there. Because it's there's not that much pace on the cross. It's, you know, it's a, it's a good cross from Darren Anton, but it's not that, that much. He's got to yeah. put the pace on it, and he really mm. flicks his neck muscles it, at it. It's it flies over Des Walker's head, and then uh, yeah, he's. I would say there's a couple of goals. There's more than one type of goal that is that Klinsman was that was a real trademark for Klinsman. One was a sort of not quite overhead, but sort of sideways yeah. scissor kick. Yeah, yeah. And another yeah. is that. Another is that header with craning his neck and really powerfully uh, turn it, changing the direction of the ball. Uh, but there's a few others, and I think he's maybe not quite remembered. 
maybe also because in England, I mean, he scored 11 goals in the World Cup, which is already phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And some of them are fantastic. So even if you, you know, if you're interested in his career and what he was like, even looking, just looking those up is enough. And then there's his uh, 30 odd goals for Spurs as well. But I think if you go back to when he was younger, when he'd just done the uh, the sprinting training that I'm talking about, he had that explosive pace. He scored the time at Inter, maybe that you referenced him. He scored goals that you'd, I think most people wouldn't expect to be Klinsman mm-hmm. goals, um, and different types of goals as well. And also another thing that interests me is when when we spoke about uh, Gerd Muller uh, some time ago, just after he had passed away. We talked about how he was born at the right time to be influenced by the 54 generation, the German World Cup winners of 54. And then it struck me that I think Jürgen Klinsmann, who's 60 this year, he was born 64. He would have been just the right age to be influenced by Gerd Müller as well. Yeah, although I, th- I think uh, that there's a difference between them in that Müller was at the right time to take advantage in a rapid development of German, of West German, West German football. You know, from the, the yeah. launch of the professional league in the mid '60s, all the ideas yeah. that are beginning to to come, the idea of Beck of Beckenbauer as a as, as a defender who attacks, Klinsman. I think what's unfortunate about about his timing is that he's just at the the end of that that period. I mean, the the, the side that wins the 1990 World Cup, I don't think they were great. I think they were a good side. But it, it's it's all, it's one of the last gasps of the German with the sweeper behind, and they win yeah. they win Euro '96, but they're not very good. It's it's not a good German. Team well, that with the exception that's of also interesting. That's also an interesting part of the story because in '90 he's in the same side as Mateus, and they have an absolutely cataclysmic falling out later on in the decade. So who knows what the team. You know, may have achieved if that partnership had, had yeah, continued, but I, or if I, Mateus had ca- carried on driving forward. But the the thing of the sweeper behind the line, it was starting to become. I mean, England put the, the nail in that coffin with the five-one, mm. and after that, it's a road back for Germany, which Klinsmann leads. You know, I remember him explaining to Brazilian coaches, "We are in, in, in implanting what he called a modern back four which was a mystery yeah. to the Brazilians because the Brazilians have been doing that since the mid fifties, you know, but for Germany, it was new. <laughs> it was new. They had this thing of, yeah. of, of the Beckenbauer figure. Uh, and Sammer was great in it. He was the best part of the team in 96 when they won, they won Euro 96. Yeah. And after that, you know, it was Mateus who did it in 98 and I don't think he did it very well. And um, much too old. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Th- th- I think they were, they were a declining force for a lot of Klinsmann's international career, which wasn't the case with Gert Muller. Yeah. No, I just, I, I, I mean, just purely in uh, watching the goals and seeing the style of play, I think um, maybe Gerd Muller was a little bit more of the poacher, closer to goal. Yeah, Klinsmann's more Klinsman complete definitely he, has, in that sense. Yeah, Klinsmann definitely has some of the same qualities in like turning in tight spaces and yeah, very, very impressive when you see the goals now anyway. And one of these at Hillsborough. Yeah, indeed. And that's a match we've um, been looking at. Sheffield Wednesday versus Spurs, August the 20th, 1994. Um, I think the tribute is sufficient. We don't need to look at the charts of the day, do we really, gentlemen? There's a lot of reggae in it. He's a nine-year-old kid. We want to know what he was listening to, how he got into England. We know through football, but how, how did Alex do it culturally through music? And what was that journey? I think that's a fascinating one. Worth spending a little bit of time. And, mm. So it's a little bit prosaic uh, and uninteresting for you if I just say Oasis, who are in the charts already. But I did find it interesting to see that they were only at number ten with Live Forever first is, first week in, and this is the first big hit. Yeah. So this just and I think that a lot of a lot of people would look back and say, "Oh, ninety four, that was Britpop," but really, it hadn't started no, yet. It they was starting just, now. Because yeah, it was a yeah. mystery to me. And I remember uh, after a year or so in Brazil, really coming across a, a Sunday supplement, and there was this article about Oasis and what a, yeah. a massive thing they'd become. I think this is before Definitely Maybe came out. Uh, but they, they were talking about it, it all, must be that almost as a religious yeah. cult. And I'm thinking, 
I vaguely remember this. But the only reason I vaguely remember them is that lots of people just before I went were telling me that I looked like this this fellow who was out of Oasis, <laughs> Noel Gallagher. You know, that's the only reason I, I, the I, I knew. Yeah. So th- this week, it's a huge week because it, it's their it's their first week assaulting the charts. I've never really got it's them to live forever. Yes. Never really. Yeah, I was going to say, Dutton, if we, if, we, if we choose songs based on the football, I would say, uh, Oh, oh, we're in trouble by Shampoo. <laughs> yes. Would be yes. the right, I, the I right like song it. for Spurs' like, situation. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, the other thing, my German half is a sucker for that uh, sort of mid 90s Euro pop, Euro dance. And there's a bit yeah, of that. Yeah, there's one about, or two of and, those. Um, yeah. Some of that is coming back in because every time we win a game now at Spurs, we play Gala's Freed, Freed from Desire. Oh, so right. Some of that mid '90s spirit is back. Uh, the uh, I know they're Dutch, but are there two Unlimited in, uh, involved in that mid '90s Euro dance thing? I, I recognise the name. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the chance is reggae for me, and it just goes Very to show pop reggae. how. Yeah, a lot of pop reggae. UK pop reggae, The Clash might have said as well. Um, not entirely, but yeah, definitely amongst them. I, I I remember almost all the tracks in the top 10. And uh, for me, in the top 10, you've got, um, in terms of uh, the music I was listening to, China Black, which is a, um, a, guy from the, a guy from the Far East with a black guy putting out a UK pop uh, reggae tune. Red Dragon with Brian and Tony. Gold at number five, Compliments on Your Kiss, which was a kind of like a way of popularizing dance hall music, which was carrying the swing at the time. Uh, Regulate at number seven, Warren G and Nate Dogg was representing the West Coast of the USA in terms of not so much uh, rap, but hip hop, if you know what I mean by the difference. Seven Seconds, Use and Door, and then a Cherry. Uh, yeah, we're all over that just because it was just an unusual that match, good. et cetera. And funny enough, Funny enough, Oasis sticks in there for a black audience, Oasis, and particularly for a younger black audience. Oasis was bringing something on into the mix that you know we could relate to. I don't know why. I knew ten-year-old uh, girls around this time, uh, you know, eight, ten-year-old girls who knew every single um, lyric to the Oasis songs. You know, black girls brought up, and I'm thinking of a couple of sisters brought up in the sort of estates of South East London. They just got, they were just totally sold on Oasis. Can tell you, uh, Wonder will sing it backwards if you wanted. But um, I remember just this moment that this group came about and there was something buzzing about the group out in the hood, as it were, without being, you know, um, um, facetious. Um, Shine, uh, Number 20, Aswad, another pop, UK pop uh, reggae tune that's managed to get in there. Uh, Simple Things by Joe Cocker at number 23, I thought was a really decent, decent song. Great to hear from him. Not sure about the Morrissey and Susie Sue. Do you remember that at all, Alex? Interlude, number 25? Not at all, I'm afraid. No? Okay, no. There's nothing to remember about it, I don't think. Again, CJ Lewis, (laughs) another UK pop reggae there. Sounds of Blackness, number 29. Everything's going to be all right. Big hit that. No, no, Which one's no. That? It's it's down the bottom. Yeah, it's, Dawn Payne. Yeah, oh. it's going down. Of course, now. it's a huge hit. Dawn yeah, Payne. massive. Do really you know she lives on love, that. lovely vibe, lovely feel about it. Yeah, she. Um, I've seen her on several occasions. I've had good chats with her actually as well. And um, the thing that makes me joke, or the thing that makes me laugh, she's only got this one hit, but she performs these kind of open air. Uh, big, huge gigs, you know. Um, I saw it at the Milton Keynes Bowl, I think, because um, my missus was performing there as well. And she was backstage holding court. Very shy woman, really nice young um, son that she's got with her who goes around is something of her Asian. But the joke about it, she goes up on stage because she's only got one song. <laughs> she eventually, she plays a couple of other songs, but, you know, the audience aren't really moving. They're waiting for the da 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 you know. Uh, and uh, she plays it, plays one version, and she goes into another version. Then she goes into a third version, and the crowd is still going. And she goes, look, I could be here all night just playing different versions of this. No, no, no. Do you know how many versions I've got? Do you wonder if you, you wonder laugh. if they get fed up with with their their, their signature uh, songs? One Some that, that stands out for me, which I think is a masterpiece, and it, it reinvents the band, 
is uh, missing everything but the girl. And oh, who, brilliant. Who would have imagined that they would come back as, as, a, as a kind of dance band? Uh, and this, I think, uh, this one got, it was huge in Brazil. It got picked up by one of the soap operas and you just couldn't move for... for, for, for no, I, I thought that would be higher in the chart as well. I think it's it's coming up slowly. Yeah. Because right? I don't think at this point, that they, they didn't have a particularly big audience for that type of music. You know, it's, it's, it's something that, that re- reinvented them because they'd, they'd become very dull. Yeah, dance, dance is coming to the fore. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, pop. Which I love. Pop dance. Yeah, yeah, pop dance is coming to the fore, I think. So you were dancing at the clubs at the age of nine? Not quite, but it's the you know it's the seeds were being sown for uh, dance, trance, all that sort of stuff. That's right. Drum and bass. You're absolutely right. How, how do you see it's, yourself it... now in terms of the English German balance? Well, that depends if we're filtering it through football, <laughs> where. Uh, you can have I've you just, can have multiple answers. This, there are different circumstances in which you feel different yeah. things. I mean, just this summer, I spent three weeks at the Euros. Um, I every time I talk to you, pretty much every time I talk to you, Tim, I, I urge you to visit Germany or go to Germany for a football tour. You you promise you do it one day. Yeah, all, um, all I know of Germany yeah, is just, is Frankfurt Airport, um, surrounded by Brazilians calling it Frankie Fortu. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> It gets better than Frankfurt Airport. No, I did um, three weeks all by train uh, across the Euros, many cities. Absolutely amazing. Loved the German national team. Uh, didn't expect the revival under Nagelsmann either. They played really well, really enjoyed it. Um, obviously knocked out by a fantastic Spain side. But yeah, if um, if and when England play Germany, I still feel that German uh, boy inside me but I think as you can tell from the way I speak and my affinity with Spurs and everything I'm culturally much more British these days Shakespeare as well so we can tell from the way you use um, your walk that you're English <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> through and through and um, thank you it's been an absolutely amazing conversation your book's over the line uh, which charts the rivalry between England and uh, Germany. Time for a new a... chapter now. Put a new chapter in it and go yeah, out and sell it. The Thomas Tuchel chapter is in draft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you think Tuchel is going to win the World Cup? Um, I think Tim will back me up on here. It's the maddest World Cup ever to say you're going to win <laughs> because it's expanded. It's in North America. It's going to be what? What's more? Anyone like, can what's win more it, likely right? that he's going to win the World Cup or that he's going to have a row with the Mirror and leave? Oh, the Daily Mirror, you mean? Yeah, sorry, no, no, I thought I he with his own reflection. Mirror. I thought he meant the man in the mirror. Yeah. Well, I did, because he can have a row with anyone, can't he? He can fall out with anyone at any time. Not by himself, yeah. Yeah, he does. It, 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 that is something he shares with Klinsman, really. He, he does fall out with people and leave early. But he smiles so at He's a World Cup winner, then. He's a World Cup winner. Possibly. Possibly. Thank you. He's a Champions League winner already. Who knows? Dr. Alex Gross, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Chaps, as Klinsman used to say. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> He's more English than the Weald or Wold. There you go. <laughs> you know? <laughs>